will start off with our land acknowledgement. So before we begin, please take a moment of respectful silence to acknowledge that this land that we inhabit, Staten Island, land which we are learning, working, and organizing on today, is a part of the unceded ancestral homeland of the Lenape Munsee. As a sign of respect, we recognize, honor, and stand in unity with the Lenape nations, their elders, past and present, as well as future generations. Thank you everyone and thank you so much for being here. Um, we might get a few people still coming in later, but I am going to turn it over to Karen uh, from the Greenbelt Conservancy. Thank you so much again for joining us and presenting today. So I'm going to spotlight you and you can introduce yourself and begin whenever you feel ready, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. Hi, my name is Karen Roos and I'm an environmental educator at, with New York City Department of Parks and Recreation and we work in partnership with the Greenbelt Conservancy. Um, also joining me today is my co-worker, Angel, who edited all the videos you'll see today. Um, and today we're going to do a PowerPoint presentation that I put together. I hope it's not too boring. I know PowerPoints can be a little bit dry, um, but we're going to talk a lot about ticks. And then I do have a little bit of a segment on um, poison ivy, because these are two hazards that you probably will come across. Um, I was talking to Quinn a little bit. I know um, a lot of you folks are doing work in Mariner's Marsh and places like that, and you're finding a lot of ticks. So um, I'm going to share my screen and we'll start the presentation. And hopefully it'll all go well. And thank you all for joining today. So um, this is a tick and poison ivy safety PowerPoint that I put together. Um, and we'll talk about each slide as we go along. Um, first, I just want to introduce ourselves again. We are the Green Belt Environmental Education Department. Um, we are Parks Department employees working in partnership with the Green Belt Conservancy. Um, trying to get rid of this top part, sorry. Um, and these are some of the things that we're doing here. So we are, sorry. So we have our stewardship programs, which we are working outside all the time. That's the Green Belt Conservation Corps, and that's our stewardship um, portion of what we do. We do school and summer programming, and we do public programming. So our public programming um, includes everything from bird walks to programs like this. And um, yeah, we kind of do it all at this point. Um, I also am an ambassador for Global Lime Alliance, which is not affiliated with parks and not affiliated with um, the Green Belt Conservancy. I do that voluntarily. And a lot of the information that you'll see today is from that um, organization. At the end, I'll give you their website if you want a little more information on that. So, okay, so about ticks. So first of all, the most important thing is we have to be able to know what we're looking for, we need to uh, know what a tick is. And a tick is an arachnid, so it's really more closely related to spiders and mites. And if you see something on you that has six legs, that's not a tick, right? That's probably an insect of some sort. Um, but also another thing that people often confuse ticks with is a jumping spider. They're very small, um, but you can tell the difference between a tick and a jumping spider because a spider has two very distinct body parts, right? So it has its cephalothorax and its abdomen. If you have two distinct body parts, it's not a tick. If you have antenna and three body parts, a head, thorax, and abdomen, that's not a tick either. Doesn't mean it can't be another insect that might be troublesome to you or, you know, black flies and all kinds of things. We really don't have them here, luckily, but those can be a little bit, um, not great to have, but they're not necessarily ticks. So the center picture is a picture of a black flag tick, which is the deer tick. Um, and you can see it's got eight legs and it's got one fused body part. So its head and its abdomen are kind of fused together. So it looks like one body part. And something you'll notice about it, and I'm gonna try and get the cursor there, is it has really specialized mouth parts. 
So those mouth parts are designed to embed into whatever host, a, a person, a bird, a deer, whatever it is, and kind of stay in there. So their mouth parts are like barbed, almost like a, a screw anchor. Um, that way it can stick in and not be pulled out too easily. So yeah, again, knowing what you're looking for when you're out, especially in the field working, um, helps a lot. So here's what an engorged and embedded tick looks like. So a lot of times we're looking for that little tiny dot on our body. Um, so it would kind of look like this, very small. Many times it's very small. This one, you can see the legs pretty well, but a lot of times you'll have a tick on you and you'll never see the legs and you'll, it, you'll think it's maybe a, like a freckle or something like that. And then all of a sudden you touch it and you move it and those legs stick out and you know that you have a tick on you. So that's what it looks like when it's embedded, right? So um, it's good to know. And a lot of times they're even smaller than that. So be aware of that. That's actually kind of a big tick. Um, but down here is what it looks like once it's engorged, once it's had its blood meal. And a lot of times we're not familiar with looking at it this way, but as you can see on the right hand side, it has, that's in a dog. Sometimes you'll pet your dog and you think that they have a bump or a bump, but it turns out to be a tick. And inside that tick's body is blood, right? It's very strange looking. It could look like like a gray grape even, it could get even almost that big. So depending on the type of tick, this is what you're looking for. Sometimes um, I have a friend who works in a doctor's office, someone came in, they thought they had like a, a tumor or something on their back and it turned out to be a tick. So be aware that this is what an engorged tick looks like. Um, these are the life stages of the tick. So, there is different stages. The larva stage is very small, as you can see. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see it compared to a sesame seed and even a poppy seed. So really tiny at that larval stage, even the nymph stage. Um, and again, the black leg tick, the Dioxides papularis, which I can't say that well, um, that is the tick that we think of when we think of Lyme disease, right? But it also spreads other disease. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, but if you look at the, the ruler on the left-hand side, that's one inch, right? One inch. And this is how big they are. They can get really tiny and you have to be aware to look at that. Again, sometimes they resemble a freckle or a beauty mark or maybe a little mole. Um, but look for those legs. If you um, Find something that you don't recognize on your skin, kind of move it around. They're very flat bodied also. So that's something to think about. So they will kind of flip up if they're like embedded, um, which obviously a mold would not do. So be aware of how small those are. And here's something really important. So um, we were just talking before we started this presentation a little bit about development. Um, overdevelopment in all areas, including Staten Island. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. So when we look at this chart, we're going to start off with the egg, right? So you see the engorged chick. She's got a nice blood meal. She's ready to lay eggs. So she lays her eggs. The larva come out and they're seeking their first blood meal. So their first blood meal is probably going to going to be a small mammal like the white-footed mouse. And the white-footed mouse is significant. So many times we think it's just all deer, but there are so many, there's at least three hosts, I think, that most ticks go through. And white-footed mouse are that first host that these ticks are looking for on Staten Island. Um, you may or may not have been affected with an infestation of mice um, in about 2017. And what happened at that time is that an, a normal occurrence is that sometimes oak trees make an abundance of acorns. It's just a natural occurrence. It's kind of like an explosion of acorns. So that's a food source for the mouse. Um, when the mice have a lot of food, their population goes up. When the population of the mice go up, 
the ticks have a lot of food, so their numbers go up. And when you combine high populations with developing on our green spaces, these mice are kind of moving into our space, right? Well, we're moving into their space, but we're coming in contact with them more often. Um, so you may have noticed in 2017, 2018, a lot of people had mice in their houses, in their yards. Um, I know we had a ton of them in our offices. So that's kind of moving those ticks out of like wild spaces into maybe your yard and things like that. And development is a part of this. Overdevelopment is a part of this because as we take away that green space, these mice need a place to go, especially when their populations are high and they come in contact with us. Um, another thing that does when the population of the white-footed mouse is high is increases the number of ticks that are actually infected with disease. So you could get bitten by a tick and not get a disease if that tick is not carrying anything. But when we have this high population, it increases um, the chances that they will be carrying some kind of disease. So there is a huge connection right there with overdevelopment. Um, so now after it goes from the larval stage, has its first blood meal, it goes to the nymph stage and it overwinters, um, but they're still active in winter. They're not as active as they are in like spring and fall, but they can still be active. And now introduce climate change where we're not getting these really cold winters where they might get dormant. They're not gonna die, but they'll become dormant. Um, and they stay active all the time. You know, we have some winters where we have really, really warm days. You know, these these ticks could still be out there and actively trying to feed, not going dormant. So climate change also has a big role in the amount of ticks we're seeing and how they spread and, you know, how much of a problem they're going to give us. So now from winter into spring, they're gonna go get their second blood meal. And now they're moving on to maybe bigger mammals or birds. And again, birds fly from one place to the other. So when they hitch a ride on a bird, now we can be moving these ticks from way down south, all the way up to New York or even further up. And we are seeing Southern types of ticks where we only saw them in the south now are moving into northern areas. So animals that move around combined with climate change and overdevelopment, now we have this weird um, like explosion of ticks and things we haven't seen before. So now they go from that second host to an adult. Now they're looking for the bigger hosts and this is usually when they're going to go for the deer and the humans and things like that. That doesn't mean you can't get bitten by a nymph or a larva, but most likely you're gonna get an adult or a nymph if you find one on you. Still incredibly small. So once they get that second blood meal, they move on and they lay eggs and the whole cycle starts again. So it's a little complicated and there's a lot of parts to it, but this is sort of how it all works. And uh, again, all these other factors contribute to why we're seeing so many um, ticks, you know, now, all right, so some things you should know about ticks. They don't fly, thank goodness. They don't fall from trees and they don't jump. So they're not like a flea that'll jump and they're not like a mosquito that'll fly. So you actually have to actively walk through something that they are on, um, like a plant or leaf litter or something like that, a wood pile. And that's how they kind of hitch a ride onto you. So they can be, as I said before, active year round. They're active at temperatures over 34 degrees. So when we're not having those time periods where our winters are under 34 degrees for long periods of time, they're not becoming dormant. They're still active. Um, so they have all that time to get that blood meal uh, where they normally wouldn't. Um, let's see what else. So where ticks are commonly found. So leaf litter, wood piles, stone walls, tall grasses. And for those of you working in places like Mariner's Marsh or places where you're coming into contact with things like Phragmites, um, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, those big tall reeds that you see everywhere when you're driving on the highway, um, things like that. That's a great habitat for ticks. They like to crawl to the top of of 
uh, plant matter, like you see in the picture. This is called questing behavior when they're ready for a blood meal. And they're just waiting for something to walk by so they can jump on and hopefully get a meal out of you or something else. Um, so really something you need to be concerned with, well, not really concerned so much as aware of when you're working in these very grassy areas um, because they are there and it's something to think about. So lawn perimeters, I would say all of your lawn, especially if you let your grass grow a little bit long, deer are everywhere, the mites are everywhere on Staten Island at this point. So be aware that you don't need to be in the deep woods. You could walk to your mailbox or across your lawn to your garden with no shoes on and pick up ticks, as can your pets. So also, you know, your pets go outdoors, they could pick up ticks, they could potentially bring it into your house. It's probably not super likely that that's going to happen, but still something to be aware of. Um, we have two women right now working on Staten Island with Columbia University doing some research and they have been finding ticks in the dirt. So that's something new to me. It's something to be aware of. Um, hopefully we're all wearing good shoes and footwear when we're going out, especially when we're doing any kind of work in the outdoors. Um, but it's just something to think of. It's not uh, scientifically proven just yet. It's just what they're finding and what um, they've told me with conversations with them. So. Um, Tick-borne illnesses. So tick-borne illnesses are on the rise. Lyme, of course, is one of the big ones. Um, Lyme disease was discovered in Lyme, Connecticut in 1975. That was the first case. And as you can see, this data is from 2016, so it might not be accurate at this point. <clears throat> but more people are at risk for contacting tick-borne illness and probably for the reasons I said before. Um, that as we overdevelop and we encroach on wild spaces and there is more, um, more disruption in our ecosystem, these things are happening. Um, Tick-borne diseases have doubled. Seven new tick-borne germs infected people in the U.S. So we're going to talk about the other diseases. They call them co-infections, um, but I think they kind of can stand on their own as well. Um, and then... 60% increase in tick-borne diseases, right? And they've been reported more than mosquito and flea-borne illnesses. So a lot of times we think of mosquito illnesses, right? That's a big deal worldwide, but we're seeing that ticks are actually being reported, tick-borne illnesses are being reported more often at this point. So just some statistics here. Um, Really quickly, what is Lyme disease? So Lyme disease is spread by um, a bacteria and it is one of the fastest growing infectious vector-borne diseases in the US, right? It's also found in Europe now. So it's not just the US, it's found in Europe. Um, and again, it's a different tick than our uh, black leg tick that spreads this disease, but there can be more than one type of tick that spreads different diseases. So. And the estimates are 476,000 cases per year. So that's, that's a lot. That's a half a million people per year. Um, so it's something to think about. Um, just a little note, I did have Lyme disease. I've been working in the green belt for 16 years and I've had it once. And because I was on top of it and I was aware of it, I was treated quickly and I have no ill effects from it. So. With all these statistics, I just want people to realize it's not something to be terrified or fearful of, it's just something to be aware of. Um, and again, you can see from this map, this is where Lyme disease occurs. And again, you, there's little spots here and there throughout the other parts of the country, but because it, it was found in Lyme, Connecticut, that's like the epicenter of where it started. And it's obviously very prevalent in the Northeast and also in um, like the upper, like Wisconsin areas and things like that. So this is something to be concerned, not terrified of, uh, just be aware of it. Next. 
All right. So here's our northeastern ticks and pathogens. Um, there are different types of ticks throughout the world. There are different types of ticks in the United States. Uh, these are the ones that we'll probably find more often. The American dog tick, the brown dog tick, Lone Star tick wasn't really seen here in Staten Island up until maybe a decade ago. So that's sort of a new one. And of course, our black leg tick. When I first started at the Greenbelt, we never saw black leg ticks. We'd find dog ticks on us. And over the years, as again, the deer population, the mice population, as they grow, they've kind of taken over. So um, the black leg tick is one of the big ones. Lone star tick are definitely being found. And you can tell the lone star tick because it's got that dot right there. Um, and they all kind of, they have different diseases that they pass along. Um, they also have hosts that they prefer. So the dog tick prefers a dog. If they have the choice to host off a dog over you, they're gonna go for the dog. Um, in other parts of the country, you have squirrel ticks, you have groundhog ticks. It's just the type of host that they prefer. Unluckily for us, the black leg tick likes us as a host. So that's one of the ones you have to kind of be aware of. And we are now seeing a new tick which this is very new and it's called an Asian longhorn tick. So again, something to be aware of. Um, the two women that are doing this study in High Rock and all over Staten Island did find these ticks on Staten Island. So they are here. First one was found in the United States in 2017. Um, and you can see all the places that they've been found since. And yes, they are here. So it's something to be aware of. Um, there's still a lot of studies being done as to specifically what diseases they spread. They are known to spread something called babesiosis, which we'll talk about in a second. And they're not really sure if they do spread Lyme disease or not. There's still some studies being done on that. The one good thing about this tick is that it prefers cattle over people. So we're kind of lucky in that like human hosts are not their preferred um, host. So that's a good thing. Um, but what does that mean for livestock and cattle in the country? Um, these animals, if they get infested with these ticks can actually die from it, from blood loss, which is really kind of terrifying. Um, but if this gets into like our cattle, um, farms and things like that, it could be an economic issue. And hopefully we don't have too many worries with it as humans and disease. But again, they're still doing studies on these ticks because they are super new. As I said, the first one was only found in 2017. So something you can do a little research on. Um, and as there's more information, I'm sure there's going to be a lot more information within the next couple of years um, about this tick. So another thing to be aware of, but not terrified or afraid of. So here are some other common tick-borne illnesses. Again, we're always thinking of Lyme, and many times your doctors will probably automatically think Lyme and not these other diseases, but you should be aware of them. Um, anaplasmosis, this is not something from my Personal experience I've ever known anybody on Staten Island to have doesn't mean it's not possible. Um, and you can read all the symptoms there. Babesiosis, this is something you should be aware of because it is here on Staten Island. I have had um, three people I know of personally that have been diagnosed with this. And, you know, it mimics the same as like kind of like Lyme symptoms. So if you do think that you have been bitten by a tick and you go to your doctor, make sure they're testing for this as well as Lyme, because this one is definitely here. Um, and it is curable with antibiotics and medications. So ehrlichiosis is another one that I don't think is super common here in Staten Island. Um, so not too much to worry about with that one. Um, Powassan's virus. So this one's a little bit different than the others because this is a virus and not a bacteria. 
So it's, it's a pretty scary, I have to say, um, virus because there really isn't any treatment for it. But the good news is, I think there is maybe one to two cases a year in New York State total. And I think they found maybe 75 cases over the last decade in all of the United States. So this is not a good thing, but it's extremely rare. So not anything to be too concerned about. But again, be aware of it. Um, I don't think there's ever been a case on Staten Island. I believe there might have been a case up in New Paltz a few years ago and maybe farther upstate. So again, something you could do a little research if you're interested, but not be too, too concerned about. And then spotted fever rickettsiosis. <laughs> not an easy thing to say. Again, not something that I've known to be common here on Staten Island, so not a huge concern. Um, but again, be aware of all of these. If you know you've been bit by a tick and you go to your doctor, make sure they're testing for all these things. Sometimes they will only do the tests that the insurance will pay for or maybe the ones that they know of. Of course, the Lyme is something. Um, but there is something called the Western blot, which is a lot more effective. So if you think that you have any of these symptoms and you know you've been out in the field doing work, make sure your doctor knows and make sure that you are an advocate for your own health. Okay. So again, just as I was saying, speak to your healthcare professional. Um, you know, write down your symptoms. A lot of times a good doctor will look at your symptoms, even if your test results come back negative, they'll say, hey, you still have significant symptoms and we should treat you for that. So most, most of the time it's um, a treatment of four to six weeks of antibiotics. A lot of times it's something called doxycycline. That's kind of the gold standard for Lyme disease. Um, and again, just be an advocate for your own health. So hopefully we never get any of these diseases because we're gonna prevent that from even happening in the first place. And again, you don't need to be fearful or worried. You have to be aware and know how to prevent it from happening in the first place. So be aware, avoid areas where ticks live. Well, some of us can't do that because we work in areas where ticks live and we um, frequent areas that ticks live, or we just like to be in areas that ticks live. So, but you know, you can stay on trails, try to avoid those long grasses, um, wood piles, leaf piles. Um, I remember when I was a kid, we used to make a big pile of leaves and jump into it and it was fun. Yeah, don't do that anymore <laughs> because that's where ticks live. Um, wear light colored clothing, long pants, long sleeves, um, a lot of people like to put uh, their socks over their pants and tuck your hair into a hat or put it up in a ponytail so um, you're not picking up anything from any branches hanging down or anything like that. Apply an EPA approved tick repellent such as picar picaridin or DEET. So these two things are again, like the gold standard. There, there, there is something about uh, called lemon eucalyptus oil, which I do talk about in the video you're gonna see soon, um, but I wouldn't rely on that 100%. It's really good for mosquitoes. It's really good for black flies. There's some evidence that it could deter ticks, but if you know you're gonna be out in that heavy tick area, go with the beet or the picaridin. Um, treat your clothing with permethrin. Um, that's something that you can actually spray on your clothes, let it dry, and then it'll last for, I think, like five or six washings. So that's a really important thing. Um, when you come in from being in a high tick area, throw your clothes right in the dryer on high for at least 10 to 15 minutes. And I would even do it longer than that. Ticks are pretty hardy and you want to make sure you get, I would actually wash them completely and then dry them. Um, and of course, do a tick check and examine yourself. So make sure you're getting them off you before they even have a chance to bite or embed themselves. So here I am in beautiful High Rock Park, and this is a wonderful place to come hiking. It is a forest, it's a wooded area, 
and we want to make sure when we come into our wooded areas that we are protecting ourselves from those ticks. So the best things we can do, the first line of defense is wearing insect repellent. There are many different types of insect repellent on the market, but you wanna make sure you're using something that is actually going to work. So DEET is one of our go-tos, right? That helps to protect us from those ticks getting onto our body in the first place. Some other products include something called Picardin, which you may not have heard of, and another product called Permetrin, which you can actually spray your clothes with before you even come out into the park, and it'll stay in your clothes for a few washings. So that's a really good option. Another option that um, the CDC is just now rec recommending is lemon eucalyptus oil, which is the name of the plant. It's not lemon and eucalyptus, lemon eucalyptus oil and they are seeing um, promising studies that it does deter ticks from getting onto your body. Um, all of these things are great, but you can't rely on those things alone. Other things you wanna do to protect yourself when you come into our park is to stay on our trails. So you can see behind me pretty distinctly where the trail is. Um, it's the area that has no vegetation. Right now we don't have any leaf litter on there, which is nice. And by staying on those trails, you're protecting yourself. And why does that protect us? Because ticks love to live in leaf litter and they love to live on our plants. Ticks do not jump and they do not fly. So it's not like a mosquito that's gonna fly through the air, land on you and bite you. You actually have to walk through plant matter and maybe leaf litter to get those ticks on you. A really tricky thing that ticks like to do is to climb up on tall grass right at the edge and wait for something to walk by, whether it's a person, a deer, squirrel, mouse, bird even, um, any of those things. And as soon as you go by it, they're gonna hitch a ride onto you. So what you wanna do after you make sure you stay on your trails, before you leave the park, you wanna do what I think is the most important part is a tick check. So you're going to check head to toe, your feet, your pants, your shirt, your arms, um, even shake out your hair a little bit, right? If you're walking with a friend, ask them to check your back. Hey Chris, do I have any ticks on my back? He'll say, no, you don't, all right? Um, so do that tick check before you even leave the park. Do another one when you get home. And if you've really been hiking and you're deep in the woods, make sure that you take a shower and again check yourself for the tick so ticks just being on your body cannot transmit disease to you they have to actually embed themselves or bite you so if they don't bite they can't transmit the disease so getting them off your body before they even have that opportunity is your best defense my most like hands down the most important thing I think is to do a tick check. So if you can get those ticks off your body before they even come to your home, get them off your clothes, um, that's the most important thing. So these are the places you want to look, right? Scalp, in and behind your ears, in your ears, back of neck, armpits. Most of the time I find ticks in my armpits. It's kind of gross, but true. Um, elbows, belly button, between your fingers, waist and back, behind your knees, between your toes, and where the sun doesn't shine, right? So yes, unfortunately, ticks like to go where it's warm and usually moist. So you will find them in your pelvic and groin area. So be aware of that. Something really important to check. Um, let's go to our next slide. Check your pets as well. So kind of the same thing, check behind the ears, under the collar, um, groin area, elbows, between their toes as well, which is a little bit harder. Um, and make sure that your pets are protected as well because they can bring those into your yard, into your house. Uh, and you wanna make sure your pets are protected because they can get Lyme and they can get other diseases from ticks as well. So, do's and don'ts of ticks. So when you're removing a tick, please make sure that you pull them up straight motion. Um, don't twist them. Don't 
don't irritate them. Uh, I always use a fine tip tweezer, but there are other tools out there, which I'll show you in a moment, that you can use, which are effective. Um, grasp the tick as close to the skin as possible. Clean the area thoroughly with an antiseptic, or um, sometimes people say put alcohol on before you remove the tick, but I wouldn't do that. And I'll explain that in a moment. Um, and monitor after, if you know you've been bit by a tick, monitor your health for the next few weeks to make sure you're not having any of those symptoms. So what you don't want to do is put soap, petroleum jelly, nail polish, nail polish remover, alcohol, any of these things on the tick while it's embedded. Obviously, don't use a match or a cigarette. You're going to burn yourself, which is not what you want. And don't squeeze or twist the tick. What's happening when you do that is you're aggravating the tick. You're making that tick uncomfortable. And what it'll do before, if it even does unembed itself, it's going to regurgitate all of the stuff back into your body because now it's being traumatized and it's going to do kind of like a fight or flight and it's going to regurgitate into you. And that's when it transmits diseases. So the easier and the gentler that you pull that tick out, smooth and easy, the less likely it will like regurgitate those bacteria or viruses into you. So all of these old wives tales or whatever they are that say use nail polish remover and petroleum jelly or soap, those are wrong. Don't do those. Um, find a good uh, tool to remove them and do it quickly and easily. So let's go to the next. Here are some tools. Again, I always have a pair of fine, fine um, pointed tweezers. There's a, a, you know things where you can just kind of scoop them out. These work wonderfully um, and it takes them out quickly and easily. So good things to have in your first aid kit, especially if you're out in um, the woods. And here's a little question and answer. So if anybody has any questions, um, you can unmute yourself and just ask and then we're gonna talk a little bit about poison ivy and then wrap it up. So if anybody has any questions, you can unmute and ask. Uh, yeah, hi, I had a question. Mm -hmm. uh, two, actually, I wanted to ask one, uh, if we should be concerned of uh, ticks in like the larva stage, uh, are they capable of biting a human host in the larva stage or is it really just like nymphs and adults? It's mostly nymphs and adults. I, I'm not going to say it could never happen. Not happen, yeah, but right, but it's probably unlikely because their preferred host is something small like a mouse. They're very small. Um, doesn't mean you can't get them on you. Absolutely, you could get them on you, and they are very tiny. Um, we actually had a camper that walked through. I think maybe just newly hatched, and they were all over his leg. But oh. something happened to him. And um, one of the other tricks you can try, especially if you come across really small ones, is um, like a lint roller. Roll your pants or your legs or your shoes with a lint roller before you go home. And if there's anything on you, maybe that you're not seeing, it'll stick to that sticky lint roller and hopefully you'll get them off. Um, but I don't think the very small newborn nymphs are gonna be too much of a hazard to people. But again, that doesn't mean they can't get onto you. Um, but mostly the nymph and the adult is, I mean, the larva, sorry, is not going to be a hazard, but the nymph and the adult, they're the ones that are looking for the bigger hosts. So they are more likely to attach onto a human host. Awesome. Thanks. And you mentioned another deterrent, Prometrin, or uh, I, I tried to get the name of it. I think I, I'm butchering it yeah no i i butchered it in the video so there's picaridin picar you can spray on yourself um and then of course beet and then the other one that you can treat your um clothing with is called permethrin and that you actually can treat your gear like tents you can treat anything anything any kind of clothing you're not going to put that on your skin though and if you do use it, just be aware that when it's wet, it could be toxic to right. your, your pets. So if you're going to treat a tent or your clothing, do it outside and make sure that it's dry before you bring that back into your house. Awesome. Thanks so much. Okay.
Any other questions? I have a question. Mm -hmm. It's Angel here. <laughs> um, hey. You were talking about how different ticks have different preferred hosts. And I was wondering if you know like to what extent that is. So like, is it a tick is in their questing phase and they see a dog walk by and they're like, oh, that's not my preferred host. I'm gonna wait for a deer. Or do they jump on whatever they see and then they're like, oh no, this dog is not a deer. I'm gonna jump right back off. Like, do you know how that happens? I'm not really sure. I think if a tick is desperate, they're gonna jump on to whatever host they can. Right. Um, it's just that that's not their prefer preferred host. So, you know, if it's a choice between a human and a deer, they're probably going to go with whatever comes by. Um, but again, there's like certain um, ticks, like a dog tick. We really don't see dog ticks too much on people anymore. You know, it's the Lone Star tick and the um, Black Lake tick. So I think any tick is going, but it doesn't mean that a dog tick will never bite a human. So I just think it's less likely, right? Yeah, and again, maybe like, they even find their way to like the place where there are more dogs, right? right. Or more deer. And right. they just and like- That's why it's like, like with this new tick, yeah, it's here, there are no cattle here. They prefer cattle, but if there's no cattle, they're gonna choose you, <laughs> right? Like Pokemon, they'll choose you. So yeah, I think it's, if, if the preferred host is there, they're gonna go for that. If not, they're gonna go for what they can, they can find, so. I also have a question. Thank you. This has been so fantastic as an, an informative. Um, my question, because I know um, I've read some articles about how this year they're seeing like a really dramatic increase of population in in tick areas um especially you know us where we're kind of like in between urban and, and green space mm -hmm. so my question is um how likely is it to get a tick you know walking in one of our parks this summer and I know that it's like you know if you stay on the trail middle of the path mm -hmm. you'll be okay but you know for you know I'm thinking about like when I was a kid and I would just kind of like run around and like bend down and look at things so just wanted to ask you know how how likely we think it would be to get it from like a park well so, like you you said if you're somewhere like Clove Lake Park where you have a wide um cement walkway and there's nothing overhanging, you probably won't get a tick because you're not coming in contact with that. But you know that same park in the fall when you have a lot of leaf litter down on the ground, maybe you're walking through that, you could potentially. Um, obviously the risk increases as you go deeper into tick habitat, like those tall grasses or a lot of woodland. Um, sometimes you can't avoid it. Regardless, um, you know, you could walk past a tree or a plant and not even realize it, even, you know, on the sidewalk. So it's a possibility and it's something I think people who are living on Staten Island do need to be aware of that you don't need to be in these deep woods to get a tick on you. And I think that might be even worse because you're not really thinking about it. You know, you just go out to your lawn maybe you don't have shoes on, you're not really thinking about it, so you don't think to look. Um, and I think that's where the danger is. So maybe it's not, it's gonna be less of a, a chance that you'll get the tick, but also less of a chance that you're even gonna think about it because you're in a space that it's just not something you're thinking about. So just really anytime we're outdoors on Staten Island, you know, just check. You know, when you take a shower, I've actually taken a shower, I've used like a scrubby, you know, or like a loofah. And the next day I went to go shower and the tick was crawling out of my loofah. <laughs> so, you know, making sure that you're taking good showers, scrubbing yourself down, especially when you're coming out of like heavy tick woods area. I think the risk is kind of across the board, but again, it's not anything you need to be super terrified of or worried about but we do have to be aware because it's a reality here on Staten Island. And yeah, it could happen. Maybe you go to the park and you're not even really thinking too much about it, but you are coming maybe in contact with tall grasses. So 
unfortunately, I can give you like a percentage of, hey, you have this much of a percentage in High Rock Park and this much of a percentage in uh, Mariner's Marsh and you're totally okay if you go to Clove Lake. It, it depends, I guess. So <laughs> sorry, I couldn't give you a better answer than that. Oh no, that's a perfectly excellent answer, you know. Can't, we can't expect people to have, you know, the exact number of, of ticks in other areas. So just the reassurance of like sticking to the trail does make me feel better. So thank you so much. Right. I think really being aware is our biggest um, defense against it. And if you, again, if you know you're going out into areas like that, you kind of have a benefit because you are, are aware of it and you know that you're going to go home and you're checking and you're going to wear uh you know, deep before you go out there. So, all right, so I'm gonna move forward a little bit. So another hazard that we have is poison ivy, definitely not on the level of the tick, but something we should be aware of. So all about our poison ivy. So poison ivy is a native plant. A lot of people don't like this plant, but it is beneficial to wildlife. Um, it can grow as a vine, it can grow as a ground cover, and it can grow as a shrub. So a couple of different forms. Um, one thing we should know is that primates like humans and for whatever reason, guinea pigs are the only animals that get a reaction to um, the poison ivy. Why that is, I don't know. It's something, uh, it's a protein that's in our skin that causes us to have a reaction. So um, another thing to know, poison ivy changes colors like so many other plants. So it is a plant, it'll change color in the fall and also when it's young. And here's those three types of poison ivy. So you have the vine, which grows up trees. You have the ground cover on the left, which usually is about maybe a foot. And then you could have a shrub, which grows on kind of like a stalk. It's not really a shrub, but it's kind of shrub E. Um, so you do have to be aware that it comes in these three different forms. Again, IDing it is key to avoiding it just like with ticks. And here's our poison ivy ID. So that picture right there is your classic poison ivy. Um, it always will have three leaves. It's toothed, but not always. So I'm gonna show you a picture of one that's not toothed. So most of the time it does have like uh, edge, you can see the tube edge, edges um, around each leaflet but not always. Uh, it always will have that long petiole coming off of the main stem. It does make a fruit, which is white um, or, or like a greenish white and poison oak and poison sumac also make white berries. So that's a really good way to identify it if it does have berries on it. And you're gonna also have that, those aerial roots on the stem. So one other thing, I don't know if you guys can see right here in the middle, where my pointer is. Sometimes you'll have either like a, a reddish or a dark spot right there. And that's another telltale sign that you might be dealing with poison ivy. Not always there, but that's uh, one way to ID it. Another way to ID it, I should say. So here is some different looking poison ivy. So when it's very young, it is bright red sometimes. Sometimes it's green and it's small. So this can still be climbing up a tree with some aerial roots, but they may not be so obvious. Uh, over here, we have our nice old poison ivy vine with the aerial roots. And you can see a, maybe a younger, smaller vine here. So anytime you see this, steer clear of it because it can still give you um, the rash. And then down here, I think this picture was actually taken in Central Park. So when it gets older, it can grow quite big. And that leaf obviously has no teeth. Um, it's so big, you can't even see the other leaves. So be aware that this climbs up, overhangs, and it can get, it can get really big. Um, sometimes, again, we think of it in that classic form, but this is what it can look like as well. So what you should know about poison ivy, everyone has the potential to react to poison ivy. So, um, me personally, I never had a reaction to poison ivy up until about two years ago. And then I got a horrendous case of it. So a lot of people say, I'm, I'm not allergic to it. I've touched it a million times. 
Well, don't touch it a million and one times because the million and one time <laughs> is the time that you might get that reaction. Um, the compound inside the plant is called urushiol. Urushiol. It's not easy to say, um, but it's like a resin or an oil that lives inside the plant. And once you get that on your clothes or anything else, your dog, it can actually stay active up to a decade. So when you go home after you've been through a patch of poison ivy, doing whatever you're doing, make sure you wash your clothes, um, make sure you clean off your shoes if you know that you've been through poison ivy. Um, it has to come in contact and penetrate your skin. It doesn't spread from one area to the other. So another myth about poison ivy that we hear a lot is that, oh, if you scratch the blisters, you're gonna spread it all over your body um, or you're gonna spread it to someone else. And that's not really what's happening. What's more likely happening is that you didn't wash something or you still have that uh, oil somewhere and you keep touching it. So it's not spreading, you just keep touching the same source of that um, oil and you keep reinfecting yourself with this uh, rash. Um, doesn't spread from one person to the other. More likely that someone is touching you or you touch something that someone else touched that has the urushiol on it. Rash occurs in 24 to 48 hours. So if you're walking through the forest and all of a sudden you feel itchy, it's probably a mosquito. It's probably not uh, poison ivy uh, giving you a rash all of a sudden. Um, and then of course, redness starts and then you get blisters and itching if you do come in contact with it. So what can you do? You're gonna wash really good. I'm gonna show you a video about that. You're gonna wash at least three times, I would say even four. You're gonna take any clothes or any, um, even your pets or anything that may have come in contact and you're gonna wash it thoroughly. Um, and if you develop the rash, try not to scratch. So I was talking to Quinn earlier, and at the moment, I do have a little tiny bit of poison ivy from pulling it out of my garden. And uh, yeah, it's not easy to not scratch, but try not to scratch. And if you absolutely have to scratch, make sure your hands are clean and make sure your nails are clean. Um, and you can try some products that'll help relieve that itch. Some people are severely allergic and they do get a really bad rash and that could become infected. So if that is the case with you, make sure you go to a doctor, make sure you get antibiotics because any kind of skin infection in like all over your body can be very dangerous. So in those extreme cases, you should definitely seek medical attention for that. So we all love coming for a hike in our park, but when we are hiking, there are some hazards that we need to be aware of, such as poison ivy. One of the best ways to avoid touching and coming into contact with poison ivy is to stay on the trails. As you can see, there are no plants growing here on the trail. So no plants, no poison ivy. Uh, we do have to be mindful though, it does sometimes grow, grows very close to the edge of the trail and it also vines itself. So it might be growing up a tree and hanging over the trail. So when we're walking through the park, look down, look up, any overhanging branches, just assume it could possibly be poison ivy and try to avoid that. So another thing we can do is know our identification of the plant and remember leaves of three, let it be. Hairy rope, you're a dope if you touch that because it does run up and down the tree with the aerial vines and it does make white berries. Um, one thing we should be reminded of is that the poison ivy plant is still existing in the winter and the fall. So in the fall, it's going to turn probably a bright red, red color and in the winter, you might still see that vine. So even though it's not summertime, be careful if you're touching trees or touching any plants because you can still get that oil on your skin. So another thing we really should be mindful of is when we're hiking with our pets to make sure that they stay on a leash. If our dog is running around in the vegetation, there's a good chance they're running in through patches of poison ivy. Now, if those dogs are running in the patches of poison ivy and then come to you and you pet them, you're going to get that oil on your hands. And all it takes is you touch your face, 
or touch your arm and now you could potentially get that rash. So let's be mindful of where our pets are for their safety and for ours. So what can you do if you can't avoid poison ivy and you do come in contact with it? First, if you're out hiking, you should probably have one of these or something similar to it in your backpack or your first aid kit. This is a product called Technu and it can help to get some of that oil off of your skin. So you put this on, rub it, and if you have a little water in your water bottle, rinse it off. Um, again, that's not the best choice, but if you're out somewhere where you can't get to running water and soap, this would be a good option to maybe get some of that oil off your skin. But remember when you get back to your house or wherever you are, a bathroom, um, use a really good soap. If you have something like Dawn, which breaks up oils, uh, use that. If not, you can use a regular hand soap and some kind of scrub, either a sponge or a washcloth, or you can even use like a nail brush to get that oil off. So what you're going to do is use a bunch of soap. Let's say I have it on my arm here. I'm gonna scrub, and you're gonna scrub pretty hard because imagine if you had maybe like motor oil or something on your skin, and you're trying to get that off. One, one scrubbing of this, lightly is not going to get that off. So I'm going to scrub it pretty good and I'm going to rinse it with lots of water. Now because you can't see that oil, you really don't know if you've gotten it off your skin or not because it's clear. It's not like motor oil where you can see it. So you're going to go back in and scrub again and scrub all the areas around it where you think you may have touched just in case you're missing something. And you're going to rinse again. And I would suggest doing this at least three times, at least, if you know for sure you touched poison ivy, because you want to make sure that's off your skin. Again, the longer it stays, the more it can cause that allergic reaction. So you want to be a little bit diligent about that. And if you think it's on your pants or on your shoes, you're going to throw those right into the washing machine, scrub your shoes. And if your pet comes in contact, give your pet a really good bath. Okay, so um, one thing I didn't mention in my video is that uh, you should rinse with cool water or even cold water because that helps close up your pores and in your skin. And if you close up your pores, it'll stop that oil from getting into your skin. Um, and another thing I didn't really mention is that if you're working with tools, um, be mindful where you're putting them down and be mindful if they are in poison ivy that when you go back to your house or your workplace that you're cleaning off those tools as well. Um, the Technu can actually be used if you know you're going to a high uh, poison ivy area, you can put that on your skin before you even touch it and that'll help to prevent it from uh, getting into your skin. So those are some other little tips uh, that you can use and we're just gonna move ahead. Here are some other common plants and I spoke about this before, poison oak and poison sumac. This is what they look like. Uh, the poison oak is very similar, but it's got the wavy leaves like an oak leaf. Um, sometimes you'll see maybe an oak sapling and it looks very similar as well. Uh, poison oak is not very common on Staten Island. So it's not something I think we need to worry too much about. Uh, poison sumac, I don't think is very common here either, but poison sumac does like to live in wet areas. So if you're working in areas like Mariner's Marsh, where it's swampy and uh, granite fill. If you come across a plant that looks like this, white berries, just stay away from it. Uh, same exact compound in these two plants that give you the rash. So if, you know, someone tells you, oh no, I had poison oak, not poison ivy, there's really no way to tell the difference. It's the same exact compound, um, but something to be aware of, not anywhere near as common as poison ivy is here on Staten Island. Here are some references. So Global Lyme Alliance, again, is the organization I volunteer for um, as an ambassador. And they have a ton of information on ticks and tick-borne illness, not just Lyme disease. Um, and then the Tick app is a really cool thing that you can, it's an app that you can put on your phone and if you come across ticks, you can, uh, it's like a citizen science almost program. 
And this is part of Columbia University, the two women that are doing their study on Staten Island. And if you'd like, Columbia University will come out to your yard and they'll actually scoop for ticks. So you can get an idea of what kind of ticks or if there are ticks in your own space. So that's a really cool thing. And all that information helps them to do research. And uh, yeah, again, these two women are out there doing this research and it's really interesting when I do, when she does her paper and she has that ready, I can share that with you. It might not be for a year or two, uh, but that's gonna be pretty interesting. And then of course, Centers for Disease Control has information on ticks and on poison ivy. So you can always get more information from that. And here's our green belt information. So if you want to know what we're doing in the green belt, these are all the different ways that you can reach us or find out what's happening. We have our Greenbelt Conservancy, Conservancy and Greenbelt Environmental Education Facebook pages. We have our Staten Island Greenbelt Instagram. If you go on Staten Island Greenbelt YouTube, you can see all of the awesome videos that we've done for the past year. We have over 100 videos, all which Angel has edited and made amazing for us. And we also have our QR code that you can scan. Um, and if you want any information, you can always reach out to myself or Angel. Um, my email address is karen.bruce at parks.nyc.gov. And I can give that information to Quinn and she can send that out to you if you have any questions about any of what we talked about today or anything that's happening at the Green Belt. And I think that is about it. And I just want to, it's not really a question, but I just want to say, so, you know, I've been out there pretty much um, in, in Mariner's Marsh um, pretty much every weekend um, since May. Um, and I, you know, for, for folks who are just coming or for folks who were in there in the beginning, I found up to like 12 ticks on me at some point. Mm -hmm. Um, but because, and I definitely came into contact with poison ivy, but because I was wearing the gloves and the long sleeves and the socks over my, my pants, I actually have not been bitten by a tick since I started my work with Mariners. Thank God, knock on wood. <laughs> um, so it, it, as, as Karen said, you know, it is really, um, per, it's something to be aware of so that you can prevent. Um, so I just wanted to add that little piece because I feel like when I first started learning, I was like, oh my God, I can never go out in nature anymore. But, uh, yeah, the love, <laughs> the passion. You know, we don't want people to be discouraged because, you know, we love our green spaces. We love to be out hiking. We love doing the work we do, right? We have our stewardship program. We're out there right now. We're rerouting a trail. Um, we're out there doing this work and we love doing it. Um, we just need to be aware. And if we're aware, as I said, I've been working in the woods at High Rock in the green belt for 16 years. And yes, I did, I did get Lyme, but that's a pretty good run for 16 years of being yeah. in the woods. So it's really just a matter of being diligent and aware. And, you know, you know, some people unfortunately attract them more than others. It's just something that our body compounds, but, you know, it's something else to be aware of. Um, but if we take the precautions and we're, we're aware and we tick check, definitely tick check, I think we can be safe and enjoy our time out in the woods and, Absolutely. Perfect.